good, technically good afternoon. I was about to say good morning. <laughs> and welcome to the 2022 Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. We are super excited that you are here uh, sharing this time with you. We hope you enjoy it. Um, please take a look at the anti-harassment um, policy in the chat uh, when you have a moment. Uh, and also feel free to tell us where you are joining us from. I am Alexandra Alessandri, and I am joining you guys from Miami, Florida, where I am still dreaming for some cooler weather. Um, I am the author of the forthcoming middle grade novel, The Enchanted Life of Valentina Mejia. You can see it here. And it releases in February. I also have two picture books out, and you can see them here real quick. Isabel and her colores go to school, and Feliz New Year, Eva Gabriela. Um, I teach English composition and creative writing at Broward College, and I will be teaching picture book writing through UCLA Extension. Um, a lot of my writing comes from personal experience, and I know that Ernesto and I are going to be sharing um, on this topic today. But I remember very specifically visiting Colombia when I was a child, and a lot of the experiences that I had there in Colombia with my family, in the farms, in the Andes Mountains, served actually as inspiration for a lot of the stories that I have now. And we're gonna kind of tap into that a little bit more, but they, all of these memories feature very prominently in the middle grade novel that is releasing next year, The Enchanted Life of Valentina Mejia. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, my name is Ernesto Cisneros and I'm the author of A Friend of Ida's. Let me hold that one up for you guys. And the other middle grade book, Falling Short. Oops, there we go. Well, like that. Better. And I too write about personal experiences. Uh oh, I just hit the little button for my desk to go up. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I also write about uh, my community. When I was growing up, I never really saw uh, books with kids like me. I never saw anybody, I, I didn't see anybody who reminded me of my own community. And so now one of the things that I like to do in my books is that I like to reach out to my community and uh, and represent it as authentically as I possibly can. So just that students like myself who you know don't see themselves in books uh, finally can do that. Uh, the world is a very uh, multicultural place and uh, I, I want my work to reflect that too. But I thank you so much for being here. I love that. Um, and I just wanted to say that I have a very similar experience because growing up, the only Colombians that I knew were my family. And they're just, I didn't see myself reflected in, in literature. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, so do you want to go ahead and uh, let me talk a little bit. Can we go to the next slide? Here we go. Okay. So. Um, no, no, back, sorry. Back to the, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So real quickly, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the story and how it kind of uh, plays out a little bit. Um, and how everybody, every, in a little bit, I'm going to be sharing a little bit of effort divided with you guys. And uh, I want to speak to you guys a little bit about um, how my, my personal life kind of came into the story. So I remember being a kid and I remember um, when we first got our home and, and I remember that we all had to sleep together in the living room because you know we didn't have any beds or anything like that and it was actually some of the really wonderful memories that i have with my family and it was kind of like having a slumber party and i know some people might look at that and go like oh how sad that you know you guys had to sleep on the, on the floor you know what those are some of the best memories that i have with my family uh and i'm always going to ch cherish those things and so one thing that i wanted people to do when they read my book is i want them to to kind of see the beauty in, in the, those experiences and uh, a sense of community and just family. And I think it just brought us a little bit closer. So um, first things first, if you guys were happen to notice uh, the cover, there's a cover reference invited. Uh, you know how they say don't judge a book by its cover? I say go for it because it's a beautiful cover. Uh, one thing I like to remind people is that you can also kind of hold it upside down. I actually keep a copy upside down because it reminds me that sometimes, you know, we see people a certain way. But if we really get to, to know the person pretty well, we learn that there's sometimes there's things going on at home um, that kind of don't define the person, but uh, challenges that kind of um, that we might not know about. Uh, so the story is essentially uh, one day Efren uh, comes home from school and um, he decides he notices that everything's wrong. Instead of coming home to a lot of delicious food that Amal usually makes, 
he finds that there's nobody home. And he discovers that his mom has been deported, that ICE came over and has taken the mom. And so now he's left to take care of his little siblings. Uh, the way that my, my life was a little bit different, so it's not really autobiographical. I do have family who have gone through this and I do have students. I'm also a middle grade teacher. And so what I did was I channeled a lot of the memories that I had growing up. Um, for example, I have, two, um, I have two younger brothers. And when I was in middle school, one of my jobs, because my parents were always working, was to go ahead and take care of them all, all you know, while they were gone. And so I would go on my bicycle and I would pick them up from kinder and first grade. And I would put one in the bar in the middle and one on the handlebars. And I came home and my job was then to make some mama salad's pizza, uh, warm it up in the toaster oven or in the microwave and make sure that they ate. Um, and yet, even though my mom was not taken away by ice, um, she was always working. She worked about 70 hours a week in a, fa in a really hot factory ironing clothes. And um, I missed her. I missed her a lot. And so I knew what it was like to come to an empty home. So those were some of the same memories that I kind of channeled when I'm writing. And it's one of the things that I like to do. I like to go back to all the memories because memories are very special. And if they're special to me, chances are they're going to be pretty special to the readers too. Um, and... Uh, Oh, and I forgot to put my timer. <laughs> How am I doing on time there? That's awesome. No, I, that... I'm, I, yeah, no, I think you're good. Okay, okay. And so, yeah, so I tried to just, I took all my favorite foods, put them in there. I took people from my families and I put them into the book. Max and Mia, who in their book, are actually my nephew and my niece. They're not actually twins, like in the story. So I don't know about you, but I take a lot of things from my life and then I kind of have to tweak them because we are authors and sometimes in order to make one story and we're taking so many different people and putting them into one book we do have to kind of tweak things around a little bit um how about you can you tell us about your absolutely, process absolutely absolutely and it's very similar like I I'm a firm believer on our memory serving as uh food for or inspiration for our stories um and not only the story like the plot but character details setting complications um, so my story is a little different because it's, it's a fantasy and it's an adventure. It's being pitched as Encanto meets the Chronicles of Narnia by way of Colombian folklore. Um, and it's the story of Valentina and Julian. Valentina is an artist and all she wants to do is to stay home in peace. She wants her parents to leave her alone and she just wants to draw. But her dad is a folklorologo which means someone who studies folklore or myth, uh, mythical uh, mythology and legends. And he believes that all, all these Colombian legends are real. And he drags her and her brother into this magical quest of trying to find um, magical creatures, specifically a patasola. But um, during this moment, an earthquake happens and they are separated, Papi's injured. And now her, uh, Valentina and Julian are left to wander and, or journey rather through a magical world that's a mirror image of Colombia to find the Madre Monte, who is the mother, uh, mother mountain, and she is protector of the earth. But she doesn't like humans because humans tend to really mess things up, uh, and they've harmed her people. And so, even though it is a fantasy and it is an adventure, so much of my childhood growing up in Colombia, of the Andes Mountains, which is where a lot of my family lives, the fincas of my childhood, the farms where um, my uncles would tell stories about Mano Peludas and Madre Montes and Batasolas. My cousin still to this day believe that she saw a Batasola um, when she was a kid. So all of these stories um, definitely were a huge impact into, this, into um, the world that I created. And it also, um, I borrowed people that I know, Valentina and Juliana are named after my cousin's um, kids. Um, the storytelling that happens with Papi is taken from the experiences that I had with my uncle. The landscape itself, all the different um, land masses that they see, the different waterfalls and, and mountains and deserts are all based on landscapes in, that you find in Colombia, the flora and fauna, the um, animals. And so my experiences and my memories impacted the world building the way i created this world and the characters 100 percent. nice nice awesome so i think we can go to the essential question which is what we're all going to be answering um this today um and it is this 
how do writers use real world and personal events to create fictional stories and characters? And Ernesto and I have given you all just a glimpse, but we're going to dive into it a bit more. Remember to have paper and pen handy so that you can write in the next um, half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, so we can move on to the definitions. Okay, so what is world building? World building is a process of developing a detailed and believable fictional world for a novel or story, especially in science fiction, fantasy, but also in the realistic fiction. So sometimes it could be something like Superman, and you're kind of wondering, okay, Superman can fly, but how does he steer? How does he move around and maneuver in the sky? There's nothing to kind of push off on, right? So sometimes we just have to kind of like let things go, even though we're like questioning things, we just kind of, oh, I'm sorry, that's uh, world building. I'm, 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 my mind's already so going to, uh, to suspension of disbelief. Yes. I'm going to my own mind. So world building, yeah. So like with Efren, um, but I had, still, even yeah, still, Superman is still part of the world building. Sorry, most of you guys were like, wait, what? Sorry, my mind was one step ahead of me here. Um, so yeah, so with world building, I, I, I think both of us, what we did, we just looked around us and we're like, okay, all the beautiful things in our community. For me, I write about Santana and uh, I want all the all the beautiful places, all the places that I grew up in, I want to go ahead and write about those because they're very meaningful to me. Um, and, you know, there is a saying, write about what you know. And so I know Santana really well, right? Uh, just like, you know, your, your, your hometown too. And so those are the, to me, it's really easy to world build when you have a fantastic environment around you. And I'm sure most of you guys do. Yeah. And I want to add that world building is a key element of fiction, and actually, we can we can move on to the to the next slide, um, because the world building is the world that your uh, that your character is going to inhabit, and it's part of the elements of fiction. And even though world building isn't listed there as the elements of fiction, the world building is part of the setting, it's part of the conflict, it's part of the situations that arise, um, because the world influences the character and what happens, and it, the concise definition of elements of fiction is just this. They are the building blocks that are found in all stories, whether they are realistic or they're fantasy or any other genre. They are the elements, the, the details, the people, the places, the conflict that we will see unraveled in a story. And there on the right, you can just see the six listed, which are the characters, you have the main character, um, for Efren Divided, it's Efren. Um, for my story, for The Enchanted Life of Valentina Mejia, it's Valentina. But then you have also the other characters in that world. You have the when and where, the setting, uh, where the story takes place, the plot, which is the what happens in the story, which is also connected to conflict, um, as well as whose story it's told from, the point of view, whether it's in first person, or in third person, um, as well as the theme, which is the main message that is detailed in the story. And, and real quick on the setting, with the, back to the world building a little bit. Um, to me, I always treat the, the the setting or the world building as another character. Um, yes. So I, I, that's the way I always look at it. And then with the characters, I always think that the characters, my books are character driven, not so much plot driven. And you can have both. I prefer character driven books because I feel like if you fall in love with the characters, you can go on any adventure 100%. that you want and we're gonna follow them anywhere. Absolutely, 100%. And I was actually just telling um, a, a students this last week that if you don't have a character that you can emotionally connect to in some way, you're not gonna to wanna to follow them into whatever story they're telling. So mm -hmm. yes, and I gave them the example of Castaway and I don't know how many people know the movie Castaway, where the setting becomes a character in the way that it's preventing the main character. And so just for those who don't know, Castaway is a story of a main character who gets shipwrecked and is stuck on this, in this island and he wants to get back home, but he can't because he is stuck on this, on, on this island. And that island is the setting, but it's also a character because it, it is preventing him from getting what he wants, which is to go home. Yeah, it's actually like the, the antagonist the yes. nemesis, the nemesis yes. too. Yes. Yes. They're not all villains. And sometimes we can be our own antagonists. The characters mm -hmm. themselves can be their own antagonists too. True. Very true. Awesome. You go to the next slide. So this is the one I was kind of, my brain was going to with the Superman. 
where we have to accept, you know, certain things. Uh, so the actual definition is suspension of disbelief is to accept as believable the events or characters that would be ordinarily be seen as incredible. All fiction needs a suspension of disbelief because by definition, these stories are not real. And so with Effort Divided, even though it's built, uh, it is written, uh, it's a very realistic story. And it is uh, a story that is happening to many people. Um, it still is fiction. And so sometimes I do have to take little elements, even like in the setting. Um, if you notice, there are times when I have to kind of move things around a little bit just for the story's sake. So if I want to set two scenes to kind of you know, character walks from one scene to the other, and in reality, they're kind of far away. So if you're a, Santan a Santanero and you are familiar with Santa Ana, you're like, wait a minute, but this street doesn't really connect to that street. Sometimes we just have to let things go sometimes. That's a great example. Um, cause I, we had the, the example of Superman, but that is obviously fantasy, but, and we need that suspension of disbelief because we know that Patasolas might not really exist. And I still say might because my cousin, but, um, <laughs> but even in realistic fiction, there is a sense of suspension of disbelief because it is fiction and we are building. And sometimes we have to take a bit of a creative license to make mm -hmm. the story fit into that fiction even when inspired by our own experiences and memories, they are not an exact replica of those memories or of those experiences. Awesome, I think we can go to the next, perfect. Okay, so, and this time I'm gonna look at the clock so I don't go too long, all right. So my inspiration for F and Divided is, these are some of the images that I hold really close to my heart. Um, so the biggest thing that I feel like my mom did for me was that she made sure that I never felt that I was poor. And to this day, I don't feel that way. Um, and I want other kids who grew up in, who grow up in similar situations as myself to, to get that really, that same sense too. So I always thought that I was kind of really rich because back then before Uber Eats and other things like that, I would always look at other people who, if they wanted to go get some food, they would have to get in the car or go for a walk and go to the restaurant, place an order, wait 15 minutes and get their food, eat there or come bring it back home. Not me. I always felt spoiled, Ron, because I always knew that at six o'clock, a, uh, a certain young man or an older man or somebody, the uh, raspado guy or, or somebody would be coming by at my house and they would be selling some rich elotes right there in the, in the top left corner. Um, and, and those are just things that I always just, they were just part of my community and I got, you know, and I got to know those people. And, and uh, it, it was just part of who it is to grow up in Santa Ana. Uh, part of the experiences was the, the trojita, the little food trucks at the bottom right corner. Um, and we had them. And again, it was just kind of like, you know, I can get some tacos. I can get some, some snacks. Uh, I remember coming home from school, my friends and I would always stop by one. And then it was just like a little thing that we did. Um, Salvador Park at the bottom left corner. Uh, since my parents worked a lot, uh, when I came after school, I would go to the rec center and there I became a, a master foos foosball champion right there. Uh, they had a swimming pool. They had so many different things. And my friends and I would just kind of hang out there and um, we had the time of our lives. And so when I look back to my stories, I look like, OK, where can my character go? Well, where else? Then? What's better than the place where I have all these, these memories? Uh, the panaderia right there. This is an, a newer picture. Uh, it didn't look like this when I was younger. Uh, San Antonio's panaderia. And uh, oh my God, I think this one is an effort divided because one of my jobs when I was in mid uh, middle grade was I, Sunday mornings around 7 a.m. I had my job was to go to San Antonio's uh, panaderia and get some conchas and some uh, bolillo because it was fresh out of the oven. Like it was warm. Oh my goodness, I'm getting hungry right now just thinking about it. And by the time I came home, uh, my mom had some arroz con leche waiting for me. And like I said, my mom worked long, long hours, and she wasn't able to, to take care of us too much and, you know, to always be there for us. And so one of the ways that she made it up for us was by feeding us. To this day, she still feeds us every Sunday. She makes a huge, huge buffet, and we get to go, you know, hang out with the family. And again, more special memories are being formed. Uh, the pool, I remember going to Salvador Park there, and my friends and I would go early on. They would charge us 25 cents to go to the pool. And then they let you swim for two hours. And my friends and I would go run over to the bathroom, and we would hide. 
and we'd put our feet up on top of you know, like the toilets and hide to make sure in case they checked. And then when they let the next batch of people in, we would leave the bathroom and go back to the pool and we didn't have to pay. And we would do that all day long until we were all really wrinkled and we looked like little viejitos. Uh, but for 25 cents, we, you know, my parents didn't have to worry about us because they knew we were at the pool all day. The marbles, uh, I was also a marble champion. I would go to school with one marble, Nakanika. And when we played, by the time I came home, my pockets would all be full. Uh, I would always come home, my pants would always be torn. And uh, my mom always said, it's one thing to be poor, but it's another to look at. And so she'd always made sure that my pants were always, um, she put patches on them. And sometimes I would have like patches on top of patches on top of patches. And I would always ask her, mom, you know, all my friends have holes in their pants. It's okay. This is before they were trendy because now people pay extra for the holes in the pants, of course. Uh, but these are all the beautiful experiences, the sopes that my mom would make. Again, we didn't have too much money, but we never felt that way because my mom made sure that, uh, you know, uh, she kind of protected us from that. And that's a gift that I'm always going to be grateful for. Um, and so one of the things that I, I did when I was writing Efren was in part, it is a tribute to my mom and all the sacrifices that she made. Um, and, and so that's, a... yeah, it's one, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I thought you were transitioning. So I was going to say we can switch to the next. Oh, one. yes, yes, yeah. We can, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, there you go. Okay, so I'm going to read a little uh, excerpt right here. Okay, here we go. Fortunately, Don Tapatio's food truck was a real bargain. But he'd, ha but he'd have to be careful. Not everything was cheap. He thought about the menu, crunching, crunching numbers in his head. Carne asada tacos were definitely the best bargain. They were small, but came with double tortillas. Efren could take half the meat and turn them each into uh, each taco into two, a milagro of his own. So just like my mom, sometimes she'd go to the kitchen and we're like, mom, there's nothing to eat. And she's like, a ver, mijo, espérate, dame cinco minutos, give me five minutes. She'd open the fridge, and in five minutes, she had a delicious food. And maybe it may have been just sopes, which is just corn, you know, masa and beans and cheese. But to us, they were like the best food ever. And we're, we thought we were being spoiled, rotten by them. Um, and so my mom would always perform milagros in the kitchen. And so this is a scene where Efren has to kind of fill in the gaps for, take the, fill in the responsibilities of the ama. And he learns a way that he can make a milagro of his own because he doesn't have very much money and he needs to take care of his little brother and sister. And so he makes a milagro of his own by taking the tortilla from the bottom of the tacos and form, and putting a little bit more of the meat. And now you have two ta tacos. Ta-da, a milagro. <laughs> and I love that. I actually really love that excerpt um, because I think we can see a lot of what you've been telling us throughout from the from the pictures that you showed and from your your inspiration of your childhood we absolutely see those details come through in in this text and so just reminding everyone that we are looking at how writers use these uh, lived experiences these personal memories um, events in their lives to create something new and one of the things that I really wanted to kind of touch on here is the details that you include, I mean, aside from the food, because, you know, I, I was hungry after reading this excerpt. Um, <laughs> aside from the food, which was, was described really great, um, it's the little details about Efren that we get in this paragraph. You know, the, the fact that the food truck was a real bargain, or the fact that he was crunching numbers in his head, or the fact that he was separating this one... Um, this one taco into two and calling it a milagro. And so those details, those, those just choice of words actually really give us a lot about Efren and his situation. They, they do because it, um, it's kind of revealing his point of view. And by revealing his point of view and the way that he sees the world, we're actually gained a, a really close look at who he is. So one of the things I always look is not so much it's it's not so much like just telling the setting, but telling the things that your character would see and describe them in the way your character would see them, not as a narrator necessarily. Exactly, and the and the details that we are familiar with, or that you know, in this case that you're familiar with, you use those to influence the character and 
and, and their world. Mm -hmm. and, and something I want to just sh sh um, talk about real quickly. If you guys notice the text on the, on the board, do you guys see any like big fancy words in there? They're not, right? And, and uh, for the longest time, I always thought that in order to be a good uh, writer, you had to use fancy words and, and be very flowery. And and uh, and that's just not the case. Sometimes it's actually more difficult to be simple. And the simplicity is, I think, what, what makes it creates a sense of uh, innocence with Efren. And uh, yeah, so I, I never had the courage before to write like this before. Um, Efren divided. I wasn't actually trying to publish the story. I was writing it to kind of just to practice because I didn't think somebody would buy this book. Um, and so I just wrote the way that I thought Efren would kind of write his voice. And uh, it worked out for me pretty good. It did. Um, and it's won several awards, which, which is awesome. Also, I want to uh, piggyback on the the, the words. Um, I think there's a, a misconception that, like you said, big words mean smarter or mean better, but they're not. And when we're writing fiction, when we're bringing to life a character, we have to think about the way they would speak. We have to think about the way people around you speak. And that's another part of looking at our real experiences and looking at the world is how do the people in our community speak? How do the people in my family speak? How do, you know, like we speak in Spanglish most of the time. And that ends up being part of my, my dialogue in, in, in Spanglish. And so those are, it's very important not to equate, not to equate big vocabulary or fancy words to better, because it's not. We want, yeah. when we're writing fiction, we want it to be real. We want it, even through the suspension of disbelief, even through, regardless of genre, we want it to feel real. Yes, and, 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 and it's also a sense of pride when you see people speaking the way that you speak. Yes. And that's why we have things like a milagro of their own. Uh, and I do use Spanish throughout the book and a little quick, uh, a little cheat on how I do this is that I use the word Smurf, Los Pitufos. And you guys, I don't know if you guys may have to go to YouTube and see a little episode of, of the Smurfs. I they use the Smurfs. word Smurf. <laughs> they use the word Smurf for everything. And so what I do when I write something, I, re I replace the word with the word Smurf. And if it makes sense because of the context of the sentence, then I know I did a good job. And I, that's how I allow myself to use the Spanish. Because even if you don't speak Spanish, you're going to no, understand the meaning context. based on just the context of the sentence. Yes. That's really cool. I'm taking note. I like that. <laughs> um, that is definitely when you're when you're writing in multiple languages. Uh, that is definitely something that um, I think is in the back of our head. Is this is this understandable to others who who don't speak the language um, and usually within context? So I like that. I like that idea of. Um, to determine whether it is. And there are some actually some really great ideas in the comments section um, about taking a class through a neighborhood walk and taking pictures to be used to inspire stories. Um, and oh, I love that. And about food to guard, to experiment. And, and you know what the thing about food is, is that it's, it's really connected with memory. So, and, and community. And a lot of my favorite memories are based on something related to food too. So that's really cool. I love it. Um, I think we can go. I think we just had the discussion. So I think we can move on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So so here's something that I do all the time. And it, at, at first, I kind of call it taking inventory. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, okay, I might be, I'm going to age myself here. But does anybody here remember the A-Team, the, the TV show? Well, what happens was there was a group of gentlemen and they would always kind of like the bad guys were coming and they had to do something to kind of prepare themselves for the moment. So they would take inventory and see what are the resources that we have available to us. And so what I like to do with myself when I start a story is like, OK, what are all the special things in the, around me that I would like to incorporate to the story? And not everything's going to make it to the story, but I like to just take inventory of everything available. And it just makes me um, I, I always like. You know, I print it out and I put it on the wall, right? And when I'm writing the scenes and I'm kind of getting a little stuck, I look up and I'm like, oh, and all these memories would just kind of be triggered. And all of a sudden my writer's block just goes out the window and I'm like, okay, I got it. You know, I'm gonna put, put this thing in here. Um, so there is a little link right here at the very bottom. If you guys would like to have the graphic organizer. Oh, there it is on, on the chat as well. 
perfect. And I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how I kind of complete mine. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, I'll share my slide with you guys. So here we go. So remember, we're talking about memories and how memories kind of like create, they make for wonderful, wonderful stories. Okay, so I have the stories of La Troquita. La Troquita, there's one Troquita in the neighborhood that had this gentleman, and he had a mustache, and he wore a sombrero. And so all the kids, we used to call him Don Tapatio because he looked like the salsa, you know, the little bottles of salsa I see in the restaurants. He looked just like them. And so there's a little story for you uh, right there. The Canicas. I could write a whole book about just playing marbles with my friends. Uh, I think there is a scene in Ephraim Divided where David's, I think his shorts fall down because he has so many marbles in there. And that's actually something that did happen to me when I was in third grade. So again, wonderful story. The Adventures of Going to Salvador Park. Uh, I remember I used to be, well, I think I'm still pretty good at foosball. But back then, I remember going to the, the tournament. And I had a couple secret moves that involved spinning the, the, the bar really, really quickly. And when I got to the, 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 the tournament, I realized they weren't allowed spinning. There was a big old sign that said, no spinnies. And that was my secret move. Um, and again, these are all, I've talked a lot about these little memories. This is the way that I actually, I would actually print this out and put it on my wall. So right now I'm actually inviting you guys, if you guys have a lot of special memories that you guys have, to kind of create a little, uh, a little graph, uh, a cluster map like this. And I want to see what kind of memories you guys have that you hold dear. And I bet you anything that you're going to be thinking about, oh my gosh, I remember this. And I remember when this happened and this, and uh, you are never going to uh, run out of material uh, if you just kind of rely on your memories. So you guys are going to have three minutes. And after you fill out the initial one, try to put in as much information as you can remember in those memories. Okay. Yes. I'm gonna put Oh, sorry, sorry, I was going to say, and then the little uh, squares on there, like when you put down uh, canicas, feel free to go ahead and expand those too. You can actually branch those out too and put down canicas and different memories about canicas. It's all the park. I have lots of memories about there. So you can branch those out too, and you can keep going. And this is like a little tree, and the roots keep expanding everywhere. All right. So three minutes and go. We'll stop you when it, the time's up. We're so, going to be doing this as well. Okay. Okay. Are you able to write and speak at the same time? Not always. <laughs> Not always. I'm just wondering if you can kind of walk us through yours because I'm really curious about what kind of memories from uh, made it into your book. Um, so the big, the biggest ones were the um, the times that I was in the farm, and I'm actually gonna with the pictures that I have uh, coming up, I'm gonna be talking about those. Um, but just the way my family was and the way they connected to to the land was big. Um, I remember them just telling a lot of stories. Um, my cousins used to scare me in the fincas <laughs> with the Mano Peluda and um, <clears throat> but also I have, a, I have a really big family. I'm an only child and I have a really big family and so a lot of the, even though the siblings are not based on my memory since I don't have a sibling, just the way I used to get along with my cousins, um, a lot of that rivalry, bickering, but also we love each other more than anything. Mm -hmm. That was a big inspiration in terms of the, the siblings. Nice, nice. Mine's actually shifting a little bit to personal memories and I'm just letting my mind just kind of flow out to memories I have. And I'm thinking about like playing in the front yard and then I thought about the grass. So like I said, different ideas and memories would just kind of trigger more. And I'm going to give you guys a little story that kind of made it to one of my books. And I don't remember which book has it, but uh, it's based on real life. So when my dad was, um, when I was a teenager, I remember my dad's friend came over to the house and he's, and his friend said, oh, good, you have a teenager. Now he can cut your grass for you. And my dad uh, looked over at him and he says, no, I cut grass for a living because I have to. My son's never going to do that. And uh, I actually had, when I was 32 years old, 30, 31, um, I got my own house, got, I was married. The first time my wife cut the grass for us because I didn't know how, and my dad had to come over and, and show me. So uh, there's a whole different story there. Uh, I'm thinking about different stories when I was a kid and my sister's telling me que el cucuy me iba a jalar las patas en la noche. And so to this day, yes, right? And to, to this day when I sleep, I have my feet, I take my blankets and I tuck my feet underneath like this. 30 because, seconds. 
<laughs> my mom told me that that's it, that that way that will keep the kukui from being able to chug on my feet uh, at night. Um, I'm hoping you guys are having all sorts of, of wonderful memories here. You guys are having like a little uh, a little mini vacation. Ten seconds. And stop. I don't know if you can hear the timer going on. <laughs> All right, shake out those hands. Um, and these are really quick. Uh, we only have a, you know, a specific time to do that now while we're live. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, the if you're watching this as a recording later on, um, you obviously have a lot more time that you can work with. And I actually prefer five to ten minutes of just brainstorming and just really diving into memory to get to flesh out a lot of those ideas, to develop them a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna give a really brief, this was my very, very rough, I don't know if you could see it, because <laughs> um, I had a very limited time, but two memories that stick out that someday will um, somehow make its way into stories. When I was 12, um, my, my aunts decided that they wanted to teach me how to dance salsa because how can you be Colombian and not know how to dance <laughs> and this was in the middle of a party with not just my family but with strangers and other people and I was incredibly embarrassed uh, I did ultimately enjoy it and learned how to dance but that memory I will never forget actually I'll just leave it at that I don't know if you want to give one memory that you wrote down now and then we'll move on to the next um, and I just want to remind people also that if you guys are watching this as a recording, feel free if, doing, if you're watching the video and using this as the lesson to go ahead and pause it and then maybe even play some, some inspirational music in the background. And this way you can allow your students to, to have a little bit more time with their memories and to uh, be, uh, be participating in this. Awesome. All right. I think we can... What do you think? Do you think we should um, ask people if they want to put, sh uh, share a memory with us on their on the chat? If you have something on your graphic organizer that you guys would love to share, I would love to see them on the side too, if possible. Mm -hmm. All right, and so. Um, but you uh, see, the students are enjoying it. So that's awesome. Hopefully it's get, it's it's giving you all um, some good memories to tap into. And we're gonna do something with those memories in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to, if you can still share if you want, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, but I will, if somebody shares something, I will pause and I will read it out loud. So my inspiration, as I mentioned, came from um, my childhood in Colombia, specifically, and I chose these images in specific because there were the two fincas or farms that were um, very instrumental in building the world that became the enchanted life of Valentina Mejia. And I see that many memories are being shouted out um, in Lou Burgos's class, so that is fantastic. Um, I really can't wait to hear what you all do with those memories. Mm -hmm. So the two farms that I um, that I remembered were two two different families, um, um, both on my dad's side actually, but one of them was my uncle who was a storyteller, and he would tell us that on the farm there was um, a little casita de la bruja, which is a small witch's house, which you can see there on the bottom, in the middle bottom left, there's like a little house that looks like it's yeah. on stilts. Um, in the la in the little pond in the middle of the uh, the property, there was a dragon. He was the protector of the farm, and you can see that in the middle right. Um, in the bamboo, there was a little forest of bamboos on the left hand side up there on the screen, upper left. There lived duendes, which were elves. Um, my other uncle's farm, I have very distinct memories of hiking. Um, it was more of a working farm. And we had cattle and we had chickens and we had, you know, horses and donkeys and all the animals you can imagine. Um, oh, and speaking of animals, here we have a memory of getting chased by a chicken and eating grandma's food. I love it. 
I think a lot of memories uh, with grandparents are very special. Um, if I could, if I could interject for one second, everything you're saying is just triggering me with so many memories right now. Um, honestly, I, I'm 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 supposed to be helping with this, you know, um, the 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 presentation, but I'm getting triggered in a wonderful way uh, too. Well, absolutely. I think we learn from each other, and um, all of you who are posting in the in the chat, also, you learn from each other as well. You see what others are doing, and you and those ideas help. Um, we know that as teachers, we know that as writers, um, and I see a lot of really great memories of first oh. time at a water park and first time at Tower of Terror. I have a great picture of the first time of my, of Tower of Terror with my son, who is a high high school <laughs> sophomore right now. And I still have that picture. Um, but it's just, it's a very, all of these memories are very special to us. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch more on that. Um, Sorry, you were uncle, speaking about the animals. That, uh, so the animals, so it was yes. a working farm. But what I remember the most of that farm was actually a hike that we did. And we used, um, we went on horseback to the edge of, through the mountains, to the edge of a forest. And then we hiked down the forest and you see me there, you know, playing with the vines and, you know, whatnot. Um, and it's the, the bottom right and bottom left and then the upper right. Those were all, it was a, just a wonderful trip with my uncles and my um, cousins um, going down all the way to a creek. And then at that creek, following it all the way to a lagoon with a waterfall. And it's just such a beautiful memory that I had that I loved. Um, there was a lot of magic uh, in Colombia that I, I stopped going because things got really rough and I wasn't able to go back. And I think a lot of that, the fact that all this magic that I loved about this, this country that was my parents' country and not being able to go back because of um, stuff going on in the country made me want to revisit a lot of those details of Colombia that impacts who we are as a people. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to next slide and I will read the X small excerpt and let me see if you can all pick out some of my memories in this excerpt. And remember guys, the, the topic of the of today's discussion is how do writers use real world and personal events to create fictional stories? Um, and so right now I'm, I'm excited to see that, to hear this. This is wonderful. With the hazy light breaking through the treetops, this scene would make a perfect addition to her portfolio, which she'd been building since last year. She thought wistfully of the sketch pad and charcoal pencils tucked in her mochila. Back home, her finca sat in a valley an hour south of Medellin. From her window, she could see the humps of the Andes, rows of coffee bushes and banana trees, and a smattering of houses from nearby towns. She wasn't allowed past her property's fence, so they, she'd only been able to draw the main house with mommy's periwinkle hydrangeas, the cops of bamboo surrounding them, the small pond with geese in the center, and Poppy's cottage studio beside it. She'd even drawn a few wild parrots. Can I, can I interject? First of all, I love this. And, and second of all, what I love so much about this is you, you have so much shows and not, um, and not tells. So, you know, we find out that she's an artist and she likes to draw and, and you don't just put it on there. We, it's, it's, it's a tell. And I love all the details because a lot of writers will sometimes just like list details and we don't. These are things that are special to her. And I imagine that they're probably special to, to you as well. Um, so anyway, sorry, I'll, I'll let you continue. No, that that was it for that was it for for my excerpt. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I, if you all were able to pick up on the on the details, all of these details were directly lifted and taken from uh, the farms that I knew as a child. And like Ernesto said, I, I was really trying. And Valentina is an artist, and she loves that. This is what fills her. She wants to draw. She wants. She actually wants to leave the boringness, what she considers the boringness of farm life, and go to a prestigious art school in Bogota, the capital, um, because she just wants to be a normal kid. She doesn't, she doesn't want to be chasing monsters or chasing 
um, going through these treks or, and she doesn't know yet, but she's going to be doing a lot of running and a lot of hiking and a lot of journeying through, um, through this world. Um, Did you have a? Yeah, um, yeah. Real quickly, I do want to remind people that we are in a little bit of a delay. But if you guys put your your comments or your questions in the chat, we will get to uh, catch up to them a little bit uh, too. Um, okay. So would would you be able to talk to us a little bit about the? Well, I guess you kind of did that a little bit. Um, but how was your world building influence? But well, I guess you kind of did mention that already, huh? How your world building influenced the real world personal experiences. Um, I will tell you this. I will tell you in terms of the characters. Okay. Um, okay. Because I, for I am, I love the sense of place. So for me, setting is is really big. I tend to gravitate towards stories with a very distinct setting. Um, and so this was an, that the first example that I thought about sharing because it was a very direct correlation with the setting and my um, and my experiences and my memories. But the characters themselves are also based on, and they have characteristics of people that I know. For example, one of the characters is actually an animal. Um, she is called Doña Ruth, and she is a capybara or a chiguiro. Um, and my aunt's name is Ruth. Now, I borrowed the name because I, I wanted to pay homage to my aunt. But in the book, Doña Ruth is a little uppity, she doesn't mm -hmm. like Valentina and Julian. She is a, she's a little snooty and she's kind of like, why are you here? I don't want to be around you. We're going to get in trouble because we are hanging around you. Um, my aunt is not like that at all. And so that was just a detail that I am borrowing a name, but the details are driven more by other people that perhaps I've been, uh, that I've known or that I've seen or come in contact to. Um, almost a little bit like the mom in Encanto, the grandma, sorry, in Encanto. So there is just that sense. Um, the, okay. Obviously, the magical creatures, they're magical creatures, but they aren't just, I had to develop them. So they became more three-dimensional with characteristics and details and backstory and um, things that make them emotionally connected to the world that they live in. Valentina and Julian, the names are drawn from people that I know, but it, but they're not the people that I know. Um, so those are just some examples of using personal details, memories of people that I know um, to incorporate. I have a question for you. Sorry, I cannot help myself. I, I, I need to know. You, you kind of mentioned that, you know, your, um, your family would share stories with you. Uh, you mentioned like the Bruja house. Yeah. And so that was on the stilts and then one of the images and how there was dragons that were gatekeepers. Did the oral storytelling tradition influence the magic in your book? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I, I, so I think the oral storytelling, at least it's, it's a very it has a very big component in my culture. And so Colombians, and I think in a lot of Latin America, that oral tradition is incredibly important, not just because of these magical tales, but also within families. Um, and the storytelling that I would hear from my uncle became the legacy of the storytelling that grandfather, father told to then the children, Valentina and Julian. So they absolutely had that story. And then we see the difference in perception of the storytelling, the oral tradition from those three characters, from the different characters. Okay. All right, so I think we need to move on because we're running a little bit out of time. Mm -hmm. um, we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna give you all three minutes. Um, we had the discussion, sorry, next slide. And this is what I want you to do right now. We're gonna have three minutes. And in those three minutes, you're going to do, um, I, I, the, yeah, in those three minutes, because that's all we're going to be able to do, you're going to do three things. Look at your graphic organizer and brainstorm more ideas. You're going to borrow from there real world experiences to create a character. And so look at the details that you wrote in that graphic organizer and create a character. Pick and choose details to give your character a name 
give them something that they want. Maybe it's a secret dream. And then write down who or what stands in the way. For example, in the story of uh, the salsa dancing that I had written in the graphic organizer, maybe I have a character there named Catalina. Catalina is my cousin's name, but the, the character here is not my cousin. It's a other character. And maybe that, char maybe that character, Catalina, wants, secretly wants to learn how to dance. She just doesn't want to dance in this way. She doesn't want to be forced. She wants to do it on her own time. And then think about who or what stands in her way. In this case, one of her tias could be the one who stands in her way. Her aunt could be preventing her from learning how to dance on her own. Then I want you to quickly identify a setting and then write for the remainder of time whatever comes to mind as you put your character in that setting and have them try to find what they want. Any complications that stand in their way and what happens if they succeed or fail. Okay? And three minutes and go. And not to pat ourselves on, 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 uh, on our shoulders, but this activity, I, I just came up with an idea for a, a picture book here, just out of this activity. Yeah. From the whole the whole talking about Gugui, how my my sisters would scare me with them. So I was thinking about you, you said, you know, the the the, the activities to you know formulate a character. So I, was, I came up with Google. And he's actually uh, not only, and this is how Kuku is actually my uncle, but because he's the Kukui, I thought uh, of a little a little monster named Kuku, and he's actually just looking for his shoes. And so instead of actually going down there to scare people, he's just trying to find his shoes. So most most of us keep our shoes underneath the bed, and so he's going in there in search of his shoes. And he's a very likable little uh, Kukui, and he's not scary like people think he is. Have you read and, a Kukui is scared too? No, I have not. I have you not read, to read that. One. It's, I, it's I super will. cute. But you know, the, the wonderful thing is like uh, I don't know if you guys are doing this too, but with characters, I always go back to people that I know. Uh, I'm always searching for like little characteristics, uh, little quirks that people have. Um, I always go back to my childhood. So if there's students in here, you guys are awesome because we're adults, but we're pretending to be, you know, young children when we write. And you guys actually are young children. I so never you... grew up. <laughs> but but you guys have an expertise that uh, that, that is unreplaceable and uh, very authentic. Uh, and you guys know better terminology than we do. I'm always using the wrong words. Oh, that's really cool. That's rad. And people look at me like, wait, no, no, delete that. Nobody speaks that way anymore. So you guys are amazing. My son tells me that all the time. No one says that anymore. <laughs> one minute. I think I said, that's lit the other day. And he was like, mom. <laughs> Yeah, as a teacher, I'm always having to stop the kids when they're speaking to me and ask them, okay, I'm not following. What does this mean? Give me some context, please. And sometimes we do have to change names. I was just looking at the comments. Uh, Mary Louise Sanchez uh, commented about having to change a character's names. And sometimes you do, especially if you're writing things that are too similar to, to the real world. Um, we do need, need to change certain things just to to protect those around us. 10, 10 seconds. Yes. If there's somebody who's like a, a tribute that I tribute, um, that I include in the story as a tribute, I always just let them know. Oh, by the way, this character is based on and you. And let them know. time's up. Sorry. I don't know. I need to cut you off. Time's mm -hmm. up. Um, shake out those hands. If you were writing, shake out those hands. Um, I had, and I think we can probably move on to the next one. I did a very quick... Uh, apparently, I can talk and write at the same time. I didn't get very far, but um, one of my memories was about a dad quizzing. My dad used to do that when we would sit at the dining table. He was like, okay, you're going to learn all the countries in Latin, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, and you're going to know all the capitals. And you, he would quiz me every single nice. time before we could even eat dinner. So I have that dad quizzes girl. I don't have a name yet for the girl. 
But all she wants to do is go outside and play soccer. But her dad doesn't want her to play soccer. And it's set around the dining table. So we go back. And then, so did you have one real quick that you wanted to share or? Uh, I kind of did it by the voice, of, but since we're running, uh, at, uh, we're running short in time, well, we'll go, I can probably just skip it. Um, do we want to go over to um, we can the final do, prompt? So or? Just a reminder the, of the essential question. Oh, yes. Um, just, and we've talked about this a lot, but yeah, our personal experiences, what we, what we live through, our memories, um, every single day can be inspiration for characters, for setting, for plot. Um, and especially when we can tap into the memories, um, sorry, the emotions that come with those memories. Because I think the readers, that's what they connect with. They connect with the emotion for the character. And every memory that we have has an emotion you know, attached yeah. to it. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. And if I can add one little quick thing, um, you know, we're talking about memories. And sometimes memories, they're not always, you know, I mean, we're talking about pleasant memories sometimes they're not sometimes they're kind of challenge, challenging things so um here um, um, in the second book um one of the characters in my story is isaac over here and he grew up with an alcoholic father and uh and it's it's very real in the story and it's based on, on my relationship with my dad too the books it is a i i consider this to be a very humorous book but it has very serious themes in there as well um but one thing about fiction is that you guys can always kind of hide behind the fact that it's fiction. So unless the author, like in this case myself, if I'm willing to share something personal, then that's fine. But if I don't want to share something personal, I don't need to. And everybody will, the assumption is always that everything's fictionalized. Yeah. Um, you can also protect yourself from, from, if something's a little bit too personal, you can always take it to, like you did, taking a character and changing it into an animal form. Um, you can take the setting and take it to the underworld, take it to space. Just be, You can take the actual experience and it doesn't have to remain in the real world anymore. And adding humor um, actually allows us to carry that burden a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, so oh, sorry, one last little thing. And sometimes taking a bad experience and writing about it and helping other people who are going through something similar, it takes that bad experience and it turns it into a good experience because it helps other people. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so this is the last exercise. Um, teachers, if you want, you can take a quick picture of this. This is not for us to do right here, but you can all take this with you and do it in class. Because one of the things that we do with the brainstorm is that we keep it mixing and matching. Um, so one of the things that we can mix and match if we want to name the characters in our story is to write down, make a list of all the, char all the characters, all the characters we know in real life, all the people that we know mm. in real life and mix and match first names, middle names, last names until you create completely brand new characters. You can give them new nicknames, but these are all characters and you mix and match. That's something that I tend to do a lot. Actually, I love that you said the characters in our real lives because a lot of the people in our lives are characters. They really, yeah, they are. <laughs> um, you can create ma magical settings from a real world, which is what I did with Valentina. Um, so you can take a look at the settings that you've brainstormed in your graphic organizer and then take one of those and give it something magical. And it could be something, you know, as as fantastical as creating a brand new world or with, with mythological creatures, or it could be just having butterflies show up whenever a character is sad. Um, bringing in that suspension of disbelief. Um, and you can get, make it complicated. Uh, make a list of all the things that could go wrong. You know that saying, what could go wrong? Um, all the things that could go wrong for a character wanting to reach their goal, and then use those, some of those, maybe all, to give the characters complications that they have to overcome as they're reaching their goal. Yeah, so so think about what your character wants and create a situation that makes it hard for them to achieve it. What does your character want more than anything else and then make it really tough on them to get it? Because the more difficult it is, the more opportunity that character, and don't think of it like you're being mean to your character or torturing your character, you're giving your character the opportunity to be more heroic and to be more outstanding. I like that. And it's true. And I think we can, if you've taken a picture, we can go on to the next slide, which I think is our last slide. Just to remind everyone that our experiences and memories can become idea starters. Our stories matter. All of ours, you know, 
whether we realize it or not. And they can absolutely be those idea starters for either characters or setting or plot, even whole worlds. We just need to do the exercises, know how to look. And keeping in mind that writing is rewriting. Things aren't, the books that we write don't just come out fully formed. They take a lot of hard work, a lot of writing and revising and writing and revising and writing and revising over and over again. Yes. And, okay. and also, I used to always compare my writing with published books. And I didn't realize that, you know, these books that are published, this is a team effort. We have a whole bunch of editors that work with us and to help yes. us polish them, too. So, yes. so please don't look at a published book and like, oh, I cannot write like that. Oh, you can. You can. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. For all the wonderful comments, um, we hope that you have found this, you know, useful and inspiring. <laughs>